Hi friends, this is Ian Khan and you're listening to The Ian Khan Show. Today is a special Aftershock episode, which means I'm speaking with a co-contributor to the recent book Aftershock. Today I'm speaking with Jeff Bauer, PhD, who is an internationally recognized health futurist and medical economist. He's the author of nearly 300 publications on the medical marketplace. Dr. Bauer is a frequent keynote, speaks all across the world, and he's really well known around the world. Dr. Bauer was a Ford Foundation Independent Scholar, Fulbright Scholar, and Kellogg Foundation National Fellow, and he's based out of the U.S. Let's speak with Jeff. Welcome to the Ian Khan Show. This is your host, Ian Khan, and today I have an Aftershock special episode. With me is renowned futurist and a legend, Jeff Bauer. Now, Jeff Bauer is a PhD. He's a healthcare futurist. He's been telling us about the future for almost five decades plus. So I've been looking forward to this conversation for many, many weeks. Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you? I am fine, uh, in spite of the uh, bigger picture circumstances, and delighted to be here. It's a future view, and my crystal ball is a delight, but being able to discuss it is, and I really appreciate you pulling me into your community to have a chance to look ahead. So thank you, first of all, uh, Jeff, for being part of Aftershock. This is the glue that binds us together, and uh, I'm so grateful to John Schroeder for going out there, reaching out to all these amazing people, putting them all together, and talking about Toffler. Someone, uh, Alvin Toffler, wrote, uh, future shock 50 years ago. Right. And uh, for those of, uh, of my viewers and our audiences uh, listening on the podcast as well, you've been telling us over 50 years what's going to happen. And you've been an industry advocate. You've been in, in you were there at Toffler's time. In fact, Toffler wrote the book after you joined the industry. Isn't that right? Yes, that is correct. And not only that, at the time I joined the industry and started doing graduate studies in the economics of healthcare, my mentor was a close friend of Alvin Toffler's, a very, very well-known economist and peace activist named Kenneth Boulding. So I had a bit of an inside scoop. You go through all of Future Shock, as I did to write my chapter, which was a delight in retrospect. I saw many references to Kenneth Boulding's work, and I remember Kenneth, with whom I spent a lot of time when I was in graduate school, talking about his association with Kenneth and his wife. So yeah, I I was there, but um, not only as a casual observer felt uh, I was a fly on the wall and able to figure out uh, was the, uh, the mindset. Jeff, you've been an influence and a contributor to industry for five decades, and the amount of work you've put out there through your thought leadership, through your initiative, is mind-boggling. Today, I think we just want to scratch the surface because it's going to take us a lot of time otherwise. Starting right from Aftershock, your essay within Aftershock, and you, let's dive deep into it. Sure. In your article, you mentioned that Toffler didn't get things right, and we're not here talking just about Toffler. We'll start off with that, but talk about what's happening in the world right now as well. So you mentioned that Toffler didn't get it right. He had many things that he had predicted. For example, we would be growing organs in a lab in the mid 80s. So there's many things that he tried to predict, but they didn't go right. But tell us about that era, the early 80s, the late 70s. What was the world like at that time? Well, um, my era was really starting in the late 60s when I took my first job in healthcare. I became a clinical photographer in a 300-bed cancer hospital in the late 60s. So uh, there was general excitement about science. In fact, uh, as a high school student in the early 60s, I was able to receive a National Science Foundation uh, study grant because the American government was so concerned about the Cold War and being able to beat the Russians to the moon and win the various scientific things. So the 60s is really the era when I grew up. So the answer to your question is, was a real excitement about what we could do with science. Science fairs, getting jobs in engineering suddenly really rose to the top. So there was a field that science could solve a lot of problems. The field that I ultimately adapted, coming to it from research, meteorology, atmospheric physics, namely economics, was in a transformation from pretty much the economist being a good thinker who followed logic to the economist being a numbers-based guy or gal that did heavy quantitative work. So what I would stress, I think, is my best uh, summary of that uh, 70s period coming out of the 60s, is a real focus on quantitative analysis. Not that I agree with it. I think I made it clear in my chapter. I think the balance is important. In fact, what I love about the work you're doing when I read up on you is looking at, at the ways to merge all this and, and the book and the other contributors, I think in large part do that too. But in a word or less, and sorry for being wordy, it was a r- real belief that we could uh, 
add objective analysis, numerical quantitative stuff to our good thought processes and begin to design policies that could make a difference. Thank you. Now, since those days, since the 70s, and I was quite young in yeah. the 80s, as you can uh, probably imagine. Uh, yes. We had no technology as we have today. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have personal computers. Like really, we were literally in an age of fax machines, telex machines. I would say color televisions were a great thing to have. It would probably have been a big thing, but at least where I was growing up. And coming out, what was it to be able to do foresight work, to look into the future of the world? And when Toffler, as an example, started predicting things and he came out with the third wave, uh, future shock, a bunch of what? What was surrounding you, thinkers like Toffler? What was it that you guys are feeding off to help shape conversations about tomorrow? Well, one big difference between the the seventies when I did my graduate work and today was, I think, the openness of the uh, intellectual community. Uh, intellectuals had not divided into conservatives or liberals. Uh, there was a real foment of a real excitement about uh, just being able to share ideas. So uh, symposia were very, very common. The idea of just bringing together collective people to think with no expectation that there would necessarily be a common denominator. It wasn't like a liberal think tank and a conservative think tank. It was a think tank and people were really excited about trying to envision things together. And I think that's one of the biggest differences. Uh, also, um, you mentioned the technologies were absent. You bet. I did most of the work for my PhD dissertation, a study of how doctors set their fees with a slide rule. The yeah. University of Colorado, where I did the work, I had a computer center, but graduate students, if they wanted to use that, had to do their own punch cards, haul them into the computer center between roughly midnight and six in the morning when none of the PhD scientists wanted to be there. So it was not a technology absent era, but we had a different technology. I and most of the other people doing quantitative work at that time knew how to use a spreadsheet. We did it an awful lot with calculators where you just punched in. Um, I remember my uh, in graduate school buying my first Hewlett Packard electronic calculator. It would do nothing but add, multiply, divide, and subtract. Um, it cost $300, which was probably a semester's tuition. Wow. And all it would do is add, multiply, divide, and subtract, <laughs> divide and subtract. So it's funny. I've never quite had someone pose the question in that way, but we didn't have the technologies. We really uh, had exciting intellectual discussions. I fear that we've gotten to the point now where we have the technologies and don't spend much time thinking. So somewhere between technology rise and the thinking that we had to do, we've lost something. Even though we've gained incredible power, as several of the other authors in Aftershock show uh, artificial intelligence, not just in healthcare, in a variety of fields. You show that in your own work too, um, allows us to do a lot of different things. But I think what, what I really lament is the lack of shared intellectual discourse with an open mind. I completely understand that. When I was growing up, having a scientific calculator was amazing. It was just amazing and uh, would do so many different things. I remember when I was in my, I think in my sixth grade or my fifth grade, that was my first exposure with a computer. And it was a BBC micro in our computer lab. And it had that small black and white monitor. And what we do on it is play Pac-Man to start off with. That was it. That was Pac-Man was my introduction to computers with the big floppy disks, of course. Yes. So when I look at and I re reflect upon, you know, the current era and how you compare it, because majority of us think about our past all the time, right? I'm one of those people. 50% of my thinking is about, okay, how were things before? So when I start thinking about the past and then I look at all the things we have access to today, I'm just so grateful for the world and technology and what has culminated until now, because now we can reach millions of people in one second. And talking about COVID-19, look at the amount of information. You could do a PhD in COVID-19 sitting at home if I just sat there and studied everything. So just to make a point, I think we I have seen this in the last 20, 30 years. And it's so amazing and humbling to be living in an era where we have access to creating an impact. I want to ask you about COVID-19. We're living through the era of COVID-19. You're a healthcare futurist. Let's talk about where we are today. Like, did you think this was a possibility a few years ago or decades ago? What were your kind of thoughts about something like this happening? Well, I've always believed that we were not taking epidemic uh, science seriously enough. It's interesting. I joined the faculty of the University of Colorado Medical School in 1973 under a federal grant. This was the first time the government was making money available to medical schools to hire economists. 
And very quickly, I discovered that the dean and other significant people who controlled the curriculum at the medical school didn't want economists' uh, thoughts in, inculcated into physicians' minds. Physicians were supposed to think about disease, not about the, the dollars and cents of treatment. So I was very quickly diverted to teaching epidemiology. And although I had almost no training in epidemiology, I was a qualified quantitative scientist, um, I started teaching the science of transmission of disease that's incredible. The epidemics yeah. were very significant. And I've taught the classes. I feel somewhat conversant in the basic vocabulary. But I have felt for years um, we were underprepared for an epidemic. I could not have predicted that it would be COVID-19, yeah. one of the uh, real exciting in a negative or scary way of uh, epidemiologic science is how much just comes from genetic permutation. But I've been telling people, even in my writings as recently as the last month or two, before, or the month or two before COVID-19 became very clear, to expect a surprise. I had no idea what it would be, but to expect a big surprise, something was lurking on the horizon. And I really believe that uh, the biggest one in the five to 10 year horizon is global climate change. But to have an epidemic come up like this should not surprise us in the slightest. That's why I'm so dismayed at our lack of preparation. We should have been ready for this because quite frankly, I, I think anyone who understands epidemiological science and the history of disease uh, for thousands of years about which there's an extant record should not be surprised by COVID-19. Yeah. It, it, it isn't a surprise at all. What's One, the disgusting factor is we aren't prepared. One of the interesting things, uh, Jeff, and you are so much more well-learned than I am, and I'm just going to try and share my perspective here. As speaking with people from Europe over the last few weeks, uh, somebody from Sweden, somebody from Copenhagen, and different people are dealing with COVID-19 in a different way. Different governments are dealing with it in a different way. I don't know what your views are on whether the lack of preparedness is more political reasons because of you know who's in power, what are they doing, or is it because the intellectual class, the people who drive the thinkers, they've stopped thinking, right? I mean, I refuse to say that it's only just the government that's not doing enough. I mean, we're supposed to do a lot more. We're supposed to have these conversations and within think tanks and talk about what we can do. So in Europe, as an example, the government's response is completely different. Government has stepped back. Politicians have stepped back and they've put domain experts up front and they're dictating the terms and conditions of how lockdowns will happen, what will happen. What are we doing different or what should we do different to avoid something like this impacting us so much in the future? Well, I personally believe that the tragedy is the anti-scientific bias that's developed in the United States. Um, I've, I'm very familiar with France. I've lived there for several years and, and stay in close touch with France, watch French news on TV and the like. So um, I can compare the U.S. and France. And France has never had anything close to the level that we've had at this anti-scientific thing. And uh, that's been a real political problem problem in the United States, the anti-vaxxers, people that uh, want the freedom to decide whether they can uh, have large meetings face-to-face uh, -face when uh, it's clearly not, uh, why is it not recommended by the medical community. So I agree 100% clapping silently when you made your comment about we should be having these think tanks and these discussions. And I've attended many of those over the years uh, in my role as a health data scientist, but they were largely funded by the federal government. In fact, the CDC, if I went back and thought of the several meetings where I was the sort of statistician in resident in the 90s or even into the uh, first year or two of the George Bush administration, when this began to turn around, they were government funded. But because the government funding um, was seen as a challenge to certain religious beliefs or people would believe the cockamamie stories about mercury poisoning in uh, vaccines that were being given to kids, we say beginning with Bush, and I, I was actually interviewed uh, by the Bush administration to be a fairly significant person in health and human services at the time. But when, a, when I pointed out that I absolutely had no truck for these anti-science people, I said, they told me, sorry, your, your interview is done. We're not going to use you. We have to listen to the non-scientists. So look where we are today. So I guess I'm, my answer to your question is that, yes, I really lament the lack of these, but I think that the best source of the discussions in the past has been the government. Now, I'm not a regulator type at all, yeah. but I think that the government needs to be supporting that. And uh, one of the reasons we're so unprepared in the United States today is the people that uh, the positions would be responsible for having had these debates and turning into policy recommendations at the White House are empty. We simply have the powers that be in the Trump administration, making sure that those people weren't there to do that. So structure set up. It's simply the cave in to political forces in this country is causing us to pay a tragic price. I'm thinking, th just thinking out loud, you know, perhaps one of the answers to this could be uh, just a lot of transparency. I mean, transparency of and data 
So a lot of data and we're generating so much knowledge and data right now, which is really factual that, hey, here's all the data. This is what this means. And this is what it can do. I'm not a politician. I'm just presenting data. And you know, when we have transparency, go to different groups of people, maybe that's a way to influence them and to help them make a better decision on it, right? Is that a way to perhaps go further? I couldn't disagree with that. I'd be a hypocrite if I did anything other than talk about data. But it's funny, I, I'm sort of a renegade within the data science field because I'm one of the few people that's authored medical school statistics books, for example, talking about the quality of data. And then I've taken on editors of uh, major medical journals for walk over overseeing these remarkably solid scientific studies, but the numbers weren't accurate measurements of what they thought they were looking at. So I couldn't be a stronger supporter of the data-based approaches that you're talking about, but the accuracy of the data is terribly important. And we have almost no accurate data about COVID-19 right now. As you pointed out in your eloquent question a moment ago, it caught us by surprise. The people who would have been responsible for quickly ramping up the tests uh, didn't do it for developing the databases. Uh, nobody was in that office because it was empty for political reasons. And so we're paying an enormous price, but I want good data, but I won't be able to answer questions about what to do about COVID till we know um, how many different variations of it there are, uh, the interaction between say one or two variations of the virus with our own individual health statuses, with our own genetics, uh, one of the other authors in um, Aftershock has a great article about the need for a variety of data approaches. And we need to make sure that we've got good data. And we don't right now. So even if I, well, I guess one of the reasons I've chosen not to become um, a, a COVID expert right now, because I'm sure I could, you know, book lots of interviews, would be that I don't have good numbers to stand on. And we need that desperately. Absolutely. Jeff, I know we don't have a lot of time with you today, but I really do want to appreciate all the time you're spending with us. I want to ask you about the future. I want to ask you about the future, not just healthcare, but of human beings. Okay, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll get my, get my crystal as, ball here. Okay. Us as people. There you go. You got your crystal <laughs> ball up. Where are we headed when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to living a longer life? Many people predict that in <laughs> the next uh, 15 to 20 years, maybe we'll have these nanobots and humanity will reach an escape velocity and we can extend our lifetimes by 20, 30, 50, 100 years. Help us understand where we're headed in the next 10 to 50 years. I think I answer that question today differently than I would have answered it uh, three months ago, um, given the COVID virus. We are going to be so strapped, put together resources for carrying on with medical research that I would have given you a fairly optimistic view about the roles of technologies. Right now, I'm worried about the survival of enough uh, physicians and advanced practice nurses and clinical pharmacists and other people to deliver healthcare. I'm worried about the survival of research communities, not just that the scientists themselves, some will die from COVID, but, but they won't have the money and will have terrible political fights. So three months ago, I would have told you, yeah, I'm pretty optimistic that the genetic revolution will prevail. I'm Absolutely. And sadly, there's no excitement, as I say, when I look at my crystal ball, I see chaos. I have an article circulating right now, hopefully to get on the editorial pages of one of the big newspapers, but it really sadly points to a rather chaotic situation. And that means I would be violating my own principles if I were to tell you what happened, because I don't have the slightest idea. Chaos means that which is operating with no overall direction, no preordained plan. And so there's a cynicism. There's no delight in telling you that. But if I were to tell you, here's what I think is going to happen 10 to 15 years from now, I would be making something up as opposed to giving you a viable analysis uh, based on good data of real trends. I'm very excited about um, our new medical sciences. We have capabilities we've never had before, but we're being set back so tragically by what's going on right now. And with respect to hopefully on the positive side, let's say we overcome this challenge and somehow in the next two to five years, I really believe COVID-19 is going to have a long-term impact. It's not going to go away when the vaccine is out, you know, I would say maybe even five years until we put it in our distant memory to say, okay, that happened one day. Let's say post five years time frame when we're back to being amazing and uh, fundings are there, everything, people are back on research. What are some of the things that you would want to see to really take shape? Is it um, drug discovery? Is it the cure for cancer? Is it, you know, a cure for uh, pandemics? What are some of your favorite things that you would want acceleration to happen in? 
Well, I think one of the biggest impediments for the kind of desirable future you and I both would love to see is the way we organize the personnel in our healthcare delivery system. Um, it is so 20th century to assume that medical care is provided when a patient is in an office with the door closed seeing a doctor. First of all, my passion for the last several years has been studying the role of the advanced practitioners, the nurse practitioners, certified nurse midwives, clinical pharmacists, PhD level or doctoral level physical therapists. These people are at least as good. I just published a book called Not What the Doctor Ordered, uh, the third edition of it. And I've got over 300 peer-reviewed journal articles in there showing that the quality of the non-physician has risen to be as good as the physician. So I'm not anti-physician. I've spent 18 years of my life proudly as a professor of two medical schools, and I'm very proud of one of my kids that's a physician. I love American medicine, but to argue argue that we should return to a system that's controlled by doctors, I simply can't do. So in answer to your question, I would love to see us respect all of the people who are qualified to see patients directly and start building teams that respect those skills. Also telemedicine. It's funny, I and very dear friend and colleague named Mark Ringel and a few other people have been pushing telemedicine for well over 20 years. And all of a sudden, um, people are discovering it worked. Well, our colleagues in the military and academic centers and people that have dealt in rural health have known for 20 years that telemedicine works, but the powers that be haven't wanted to do it because it got in their way. So I think we need to come back with just as much an acceptance of telemedicine, the virtual relationship. In other words, you and I, instead of talking about the future, could be talking about my heart condition. There's just no need for us to be having this face-to-face, -face, and it doesn't need to be between just a doctor and a patient. I also think we need to change the healthcare delivery system. I, I think that health insurance is a terrible way to build on the future of healthcare because health insurance is controlled by the people that have financial interests. So I'm taking a big position um, as a real gadfly, trying to get the insurance companies to think about quitting this waste of all the resources we put into processing payment and start de delivering care directly. So I, instead of figuring out ways to make insurance more affordable, I'd like to start societies thinking about ways to make healthcare more, more affordable so that we take the most common diseases, the diabetes, the mental health conditions, and, and start providing those in the community rather than um, giving you insurance to people that may not be capable of doing it in a good way. And it's fascinating. I know that you're in Canada and um, I'm not the first person to come up with that idea. Your current prime minister, um, health and social welfare guy, a guy named Mark Lalonde, back in the 70s, started thinking, you know, Canada's a very progressive country. My grandpa was Canadian. I love Canada. But Lalonde came up with the idea, why don't we just start, you know, let, let's not talk about universal health insurance. Let's talk about universal access. So let's find the diseases, the top five diseases that most Canadians or U.S. Americans are dying from and provide care directly to them. And so I can ramble. I've got several more ideas, but my whole point is let's get creative and reinvent the healthcare delivery system. It's sort of like the dilemma my Parisian friends are facing right now in Notre Dame. Do you want to rebuild Notre Dame to look like it did in 1300 or to meet the needs of a religious and cultural community for the 21st century? I'm clearly in the latter camp. And so rather than figure out how to rebuild what we had, let's admit it had lots of flaws and Notre Dame did burn to the ground, which is after all a pretty big flaw and uh, redesign. So not not restore, but redesign. And, and so I get real excited and you notice my first couple of answers to your question. And lot, hats off to people like you and other contributors to Aftershock who are doing the same thing. But I'd love to use this as an opportunity to think of doing things differently and better with the new tools that you so rightly posited as the Questions Foundation. Amazing. Jeff, thank you. I can't thank you enough for your time. One final thing, tell our uh, listeners and viewers, where can they find more information about you? Follow your work. Tell us about your book. Just point us in the right direction. A couple of them. The latest one is um, not what the doctor ordered. The one before that is Upgrading Leadership's Crystal Ball, which is a lot about the things that you and I talked about. My website is a good uh, place to start, and it's Jeff Bauer Words, J-E-F-F-B-A-U-E-R-W-O-R-D-S, Dot com. It's in beta right now. I'm just revising my professional stance as I also pursue a dream to become a struggling artist. And so what I'm really trying to do as a futurist, by the way, is to merge my quantitative and scientific backgrounds with my artistic background. And I actually had a foundation grant from the Kellogg Foundation about 30 years ago to learn to be an artist. And they gave me that as an assistant chancellor at an academic health center. So I'm trying to merge the worlds of art and that. And jeffbauerwords.com is a good place to uh, get started. And I love dialogue. I can learn a lot from people uh, just uh, you know engaging in discussions. It's wonderful you are doing this. And again, I appreciate the other contributors to Aftershock, but uh, jeffbauerwords.com will uh, show you my new mission to create 
or to merge artistic thinking with scientific thinking and imagine new possibilities. And anyone that looks will see the title of my blog in my, my latest blog post on the website is called In Search of Green Swans. Um, we're always looking for the rare event, the black swan, but at least black swans exist. My new passion is to create green swans. And then um, three to five years from now, as you and I both believe, I agree with you, by the way, um, hopefully things are back to a semblance of normality that allows us to uh, think constructively about the future. Let's do some green swans. Amazing. Jeff, thank you so much. Please, folks, check out Jeff's work, Not What the Doctor Ordered, third edition, updating leadership's crystal ball, some really amazing works by Jeff. Also, his website, jeffbauerwords.com. Jeff, thank you so much. We wish you a safe time, a safe passage through COVID-19 and this era that surrounded us right now. But please keep writing, keep inspiring us. Tell us about what's happening because people are listening. We're listening to you and hopefully we're going to catch up uh, real soon. Thank you so much. I look forward to coming up to Toronto and uh, doing that face-to-face when it's safe. You stay safe too. Absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hey friend, this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com. 